Good morning, kids, and today we're checking out, a, yeah, a brand new video from Rono Gaming about the human-consuming Kuritzel species, well, from Kuritzels. Well, the evolutionary biology explained. Let's go. We got 30 minutes, so let's Invasive uh, species, make this no matter how short. small or seemingly insignificant, can cause a lot of issues for any native animal in the area. We tend to think hmm, that even funny. predators of the initial area maybe could do something about this new invasive species, but the reality is, it just depends on how capable those predators are, and if they even know how to hunt something like that. For instance, take way back in the day, a cataclysmic event would take place when a land bridge between hmm. North and South America formed. Animals in South America typically had oh, two yeah. classes of predators roaming the area marsupials, and predatory birds. These animals were an absolute terror to anything that they were hunting. Especially adapted in hunting techniques, they would be very likely appearing as more methodical, as it's said in their hunting patterns, but then again, I mean, humans weren't there, so it's not like we 100% know. But when yeah, the land bridge no formed, idea. this introduced South America to North America's predators. This would be the beginning of the end. Large cats would roam across the land bridge, coming into contact with the other predators. In some cases, such as with the predatory birds who were flightless, they would be eaten in droves. The larger, yeah, more slower marsupial-based predators would then be out hunted in the generalized area, leading to starvation and then their eventual extinction. While South America's yeah, native predators gone. were highly adapted to that area, and by all accounts, the North American predators shouldn't have been, turns out the North American predators were just more fit for that environment despite having never evolved there. Still to this day, large cats are now considered the top predators of an area, and as far as we know, the predators of old are long gone. This is to point out that even though something may not seem like a big issue, maybe because another animal may be smaller or less equipped, there are still many variables that make a species potentially more fit to a specific environment. And with humans being top dog at this point, you know everything is trying to come for our title. Which is a perfect segue talk? into today's topic. <laughs> In the events of critters, a species would escape an intergalactic jail and be slated for extinction, or at least they were, but they would however escape and then make their way to Earth, where they would begin immediately eating everything in sight. Looking like a feral Furby, they behaved as such as well. <laughs> However, what yeah, made this species so adapted like to our that. planet, and what internal biology is there to support this? Let's discuss that in today's episode, covering the movie Critters. We kick off our story today with it being violently 80s. Heading oh, over to God. an asteroid, it's essentially Alcatraz. A radio call goes out discussing clicked. how some of the Krites, which is actually spelled with a K, not with a C, these being their prisoners on board, had to have some of them taken out to simply make their food last longer. Appearing to be a voracious species, they simply can easily overwhelm their food sources, so it's easier just to annihilate mm -hmm. them rather than trying to keep feeding them. Just, just Interesting take. Them all. Looking at kill whatever this thing is, it's watching them come through the door, the Krites are somehow able to blow the lock as they steal a ship and make a break for it. The bounty hunters are then mobilized as they strap on... <laughs> what is that thing? Like a, a Martian Slenderman? Anyways, <laughs> uh, what's more disturbing is their ability to take on hominid traits, which evolutionarily speaking means they must have been hunting things that could take on the visage of, which... Not good. So anyhow, they lock and load Brides of Christ, and then we get a briefing. Heading out, they are now headed to the most Alpha Chad planet of them all, Earth. Oh. Heading to a farm in the middle of nowhere, it's the 80s, and they're on a farm. So Ooh, you know it has to start with everyone, like, super jazzed to be alive World War Z style and eating breakfast together. Like, seriously, April is already getting calls from boys at, like, 8 a.m. The dad is working on crap in the basement. Like, I get it, but, oh, man, it is too early on. for all that. And I can say that, having woken up at 6 a.m., pounded back Man, I wake up at 6, and I still take an hour to get moving. Coffee to write this. Then at again, least. it's a farm, so maybe they wake up even earlier than that. I don't know. The yeah, sun comes down, coffee. trying to skip school with a temp of 106 degrees. Maybe not that convincing. The butter zone is 100.5. You barely feel warm enough for it to be detected, but it clearly shows an infection of some sort, whereas 106 degrees means that your brain's proteins are starting to denature, and you would be hallucinating hardcore. Anyhow, April gets yeah, up and leaves for school that. as Brad heads upstairs. And again, I have to ask, how are these school schedules working? Why would you not leave at the same time? And why is she ready and he's not? And why am I nitpicking a movie almost 40 years old? I know, right? 40 I feel years? Old too. God, I wasn't I even realize. alive in the 80s. Well, technically not true. At least half of me was already alive. Remember, Roanoke is stored in the box. Jumping over to the police <laughs> station, you know, with Critters, no. there is a massive similarity between E.T. and Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which I'm totally about to complain. I've got an appeal that expires in two days as Amazon <laughs> recently acquired MGM, and they are... Oh, oh, be right back. And we're back. They're releasing a game for this movie, so you know what that means. Oh, yeah. They're copywriting everything in this site, even if they don't actually uh, have the legal basis to do so. One more day, they have to respond to my appeal. Hopefully, they know that they're in the wrong. We'll find out. So we get a massively dated Hopefully. 80s reference about John Travolta being a waiter in Tampa or something. 
I'm sure that means something, but perhaps the archives uh, are incomplete. No idea. So a guy is in there, like in the back of the police station, sleeping off his drinking, and they put his bottle in there with them, which is an interesting concept. <laughs> Charlie is an alcoholic, but appears as though he's having auditory hallucinations as well. You know, the whole... The CIA is putting radio transmitters in my teeth sort of thing, which is indicative <laughs> of a schizophrenic break, if I remember correctly. Of or maybe all. it's a psychotic break. I can't really remember. Anyways, probably just good to ignore that, though. I mean, it is the 80s, after all. So as the Wish version Send of two way. Peter Quills continue to be brief, they get info on where the critters landed. A primitive planet full of hyper-intelligent, anxious species of primates uh, in order to not alert them of their presence, which is key. They're trying not to alert them of their presence. They watch a full 30 minutes instead of 20 seconds, choosing to take on the power metal look. It's important to remember that with this class of music, um, power is okay. actually coming from the hair. Although, I mean, I don't know. Would I even call this power metal? Eh, it's probably just 80s What's rock, but it's definitely fueled by baking soda. So the creatures <laughs> then reverse melt themselves and commit identity theft. Now, I briefly touched on this earlier, but... This is a pretty alarming adaptation. Given that this species is in fact a hominid, there would be no point in the subterfuge of another animal of lesser intelligence. You could just kind of go after them like our species did. And this would seem to suggest that the bounty hunter species actually would hunt other hominids such mm. as themselves. I mean, humans, when we hunt, we make noises similar to other animals to draw them in. But if something was looking at you and you needed to fit in, um, this would make like the implications of this very very strange so yeah. it would be some sort of necessity to look like the prey they were hunting and be identified as friend rather than foe and this may suggest that there were potentially multiple sapient species on their planet that could have hunted one another for food infiltrating a group and then taking them out before going back to their original form cool concept but that when was, you take into consideration yeah, even sense. humans experience the uncanny valley effect which is basically going to mean that when you look like something that like or look at something that looks somewhat human but isn't fully human it freaks your brain out Kind of makes you yeah. wonder why we actually have that. And it makes this ability to transform into prey or <laughs> what you're hunting pretty horrifying. So heading back over to the farm, Freaking the dad works on a run. truck asking for a carburetor. Bro, just grab it. Or better yet, why didn't you just put it on like the side of the truck or even put it on the intake manifold? So Brad and Charlie are just kind of screwing around outside blowing stuff up. And I have to ask again, shouldn't Brad be at school? The dad um, wants to try to get his truck yeah, fired up definitely. before dark as Mr. Cool Guy then shows up in his 1983 Porsche 944 or 944. I don't know. I don't keep up with Porsche. Don't get too hot and bothered over it. See, this was the 80s, and I don't know if it was just the collective coke <laughs> usage or what, but the inline four, I mean, it did only have a displacement of 151 cubic inches, but it did create 150 horsepower at 5,500 RPM on the tax. So that's, you know, not terrible. Now, um, I mean, yeah, I can't say it yes, was a complete Euro trash vehicle. Look, I'll be honest. I don't know shit about calls of vehicles. So I'm just going to let them rant and ramble. Because it did have a top speed of 162.1 miles per hour or 261 kilometers per hour. This was actually the fastest four cylinder at that time. However, was it a great vehicle to climb over farm roads on? Absolutely not. But did it make you look like a cool guy? No. But could <laughs> oh, you pick up a hell? farmer's daughter and potentially get your vehicle shot several times as you park it into the garage to this day due to you sneaking her out late one night and it's still there and you fully intend on fixing those holes in the sheet metal but you started a YouTube career instead so that takes up more time than you initially imagined. Yes. Uh, Anyhow, April pulls up with Steve from New York okay. as the dad demands, well, you can't haul much hay in this. You're worth, but it's really attributed to how much hay you can haul. I mean, <laughs> I can carry a mean hay bale, ladies. I'm not trying to get shot, though. So April then gets hit in the butt cheek by a rock Ow. from a slingshot as Brad gets in trouble for it. Brad then heads upstairs and immediately begins playing the angsty music as he hears Dr. Mambo meowing from the roof. Also, Power of the Freaking Night is playing all over this movie. You cannot escape this song. Some say oh, it was damn. the only song available to anyone in the <laughs> 80s. That's pretty rough. So that night, they eat dinner together quietly as Steve compliments the meal. And you know, Steve drives a trash car by my standards, but gratitude is never trash. Steve is actually kind of a Chad. Gratitude April is, is pushing to go for a ride in the Porsche, but it's never about a ride in the car, depending on the phrasing. I mean, we were all 16 huh. once, even yours truly. Brad then sees them get into the car and immediately drive five feet over to the barn, just out of view. Operation cannot get caught and get your car shot a second time, engaged. <laughs> so lighting a gas lamp in the hayloft, the lord that's violently dangerous, the old man then knocks on Brad's door and brings some food as the dad takes his slingshot. Brad is grounded for two weeks, no movies, for a whole two weeks. April keeps making money moves on Steve, but he's like, bro, I don't know if this is a good idea. But he eventually ignores that idea because he's not thinking with his north brain, just the south one. Completely understandable, Steve. Oh, Have a good day. So oh, Brad sneaks it, out of that moment as the ship from earlier. Lord, I almost forgot what we were like. Act oh, boy. We'll, we'll go and need a cut. <laughs> Okay, we're back, and we're talking about the critters. Talking about this movie makes its way towards the atmosphere. Oh boy. Passing Charlie, I now realize that they are in Kansas, where you can watch your dog run away for three weeks. I'll never understand. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Every time I go to, like, 
the middle of the country, like when I'm driving through and I get out for gas or something, I feel like a large predatory bird could swoop down on me at any moment. So as the ship lands, the dad sees that the son ends up in a tree because he was trying to escape the house. And April remarks, oh, the earth moved. <laughs> okay. So the old man then spots Brad now. in a tree, and they go to check out whatever it was heading towards the field. As the creatures in the ship talk, it was minorly damaged, I'm not really sure why, but they begin discussing getting food. So, here's an interesting observation of these creatures. Hmm. They are past sentience and they actually have reached sapience, like homo sapiens. Sapience is essentially abstract thought. They appear to be able to yeah, like okay. pack hunt overall, which can lead to a high ability to socialize with one another, and out of that, even language has developed. Now, it's unknown how intelligent they actually are, but considering they can fly a spaceship and can communicate as such, rendering a species hmm. extinct as deemed by other species as necessary is a bit of a moral gray area. Uh, I mean, who's yeah. the real villain in this story? Was, um, now, a case could be made that this particular group committed some sort of crime, but the lore states the galactic community was gunning for their complete destruction. Yeesh. So as Brad and his old man approach, them. they find one of the bulls has been completely torn apart. They retreat and realize, probably need a way to defend ourselves. On a road in the middle of nowhere, Jeff then shoots his shot 2024 as Sally on dispatch shuts him down. I mean, there are like four people oh. in this town, Sally. You gotta choose someone. The officer <laughs> then sees a tumbleweed and Make immediately crashes his car. All right, then. What? Bit of an overreaction what? there, brother. He pulls out his beaten stick to literally beat the dog that I, he thinks I, ran in front of him, which... <laughs> why? But then he takes a know. quill to the leg. He gets dragged under the vehicle and then is eaten. While that's going on, outside of the house, the critters are making further money moves. Scaring the cat, thankfully Dr. Mambo is able to escape the creatures as oh, Helen then checks outside and drops a plate that breaks all within the air vent. Oops. Also, the cat's name is not Dr. Mambo, but that's my cat. And mentally, I connect with all cats as my cat pretty much immediately. <laughs> it's a toxoplasmosis, probably. Anyhow, as she checks a second is. time, a she spots a pair of red eyes outside the window. The dad then comes back and checks, but sees absolutely nothing. So finally, the bounty hunters arrive as these dudes flew halfway across the galaxy and, like, one of them still hasn't transformed. He actually gets yelled at by face. the other for, like, slacking. So he finds a perfectly safe, non-copyrightable visage, trademark, and then they're ready to move out. Also, he says nothing likes him. Wouldn't it be he doesn't like any of them? Do they have to like you for you to transform? Say so what now, brother? Maybe, I don't so know. So as they get out of the ship, what they the find the bull has been eaten and then make their way outwards to find the escapees. As the dad goes to call the cops, the phone is dead. And next, the power goes out. So they decide to go outside and head into the cellar. Checking the fuse box, it's been chewed through. How the creatures knew about human tech and in like any capacity is a little odd, but that would suggest that know. humans are on know. the right path mentally as other species concerning like how our technology is organized and how it works, which is rather interesting. But this shows that this species, specifically the critters, and I mean, they did just, you know, fly a ship, but they are rather intelligent themselves, which let's discuss that for a moment. Given the eyes that we have seen earlier, this is absolutely a predator. They appear to prefer meat, but there is evidence to suggest that they actually are in fact omnivores as basically mentioned in other movies. They oh. will obviously tumbleweed okay. around, meaning that likely on their home planet, it was a relatively flat place, indicating that Kansas is absolutely ripe for the picking. <laughs> Along with this, they tend to group up when they attack, showing they are pack hunters, meaning very likely their prey would have been much larger on their own planet because they would have needed to group up to like take them down. Yeah. It would be only natural that they would be ending up more intelligent in the long run, as the more stupid members of their pack would have likely met their end. Their hunting style is much like that of wolves, from what we can see with the forward-facing eyes as mentioned, indicate this. They will run down their mm -hmm. prey and may in some ways possibly be persistent hunters, but will typically ambush, which is complemented by their size. Maybe Observing their prey roll. first and sneaking up on them, they can work out how to and like what is the best way to bring them down concerning normal animals, but with humans, as we will see, it's a little more difficult given that we can pick up a stick and batter up, so to speak. <laughs> we will get more into their physiology here in a moment. So as the dad then turns a the flashlight back, he spots something morphing in the corner. My god, it's a feral Furby. That's what happens oh, when you no. let these things alone for too long. They develop a taste for human flesh. It begins attacking the dad as it shoots a quill at him, but the dad does like the Giga Chad thing and introduces it to the human countermeasure, a literal hammer. Giving it a <laughs> few Ubadugas, the creature then retreats. So again, we see evidence of ambush tactics here. The Krite knew he was there all along, but it appeared to be alone. And because of this, it held off on its attack until the rest of the group would have arrived, giving it time to deal with larger prey. Hmm. In a moment though, you can see it has defensive capabilities not initially seen. The quills like on its back quills. are able to be yeah. fired, indicating that under the skin, it would almost be like a pistol shrimp sort of ability. Biological catches that allow for pressure to build and then fire forward. Something under the quill would likely do the same, where it catches a lever of sorts beneath the quill, pressure builds through muscular contractions until it reaches a point where the pressure overwhelms We'll be right back, and we're back.
overwhelms the friction of the catch and then fires forward, allowing the quill to be shot out. And Along with this, bang. it can aim it, and it possesses a small amount of neurotoxin. This neurotoxin appears to do several things. As we will see, depending on the location, such as in the neck, this can actually render prey unconscious. However, if it hits the lower area of the body, the neurotoxin itself isn't able to reach the brain in any large concentration, so consciousness is not lost. It will, however, mm -hmm. affect the neuromuscular junctions of its prey, and hitting the father of this immobilizes some of his limbs, making it difficult to control. But how does that work? It's as simple as blocking the ability of the nerve to pass along the next electrical impulse. Yeah, might be targeting the synaptic gap, it may potentially it. form a barrier so that neurochemicals to continue movement cannot reach the receptors of the next nerve, stopping signaling that is in the body. It may also be that it just flat out disrupts the depolarization of a neuron by blocking potassium uptake, which in turn causes the neuron not to fire. It could really be both, given the ability to disrupt the nervous system functioning, but either way, yeah. it is only possible if the quill remains in the body. Upon its removal, right, the neurotoxin easy. rapidly dissipates as the body will remove it, likely through the glymphatic system. This would open, allowing for fluid to rapidly flow around nerves, such as in the brain, for instance, causing the toxins to literally be washed away. However, while it's continuously being injected into the system by the quill, this continues to cause problems. So with the bounty hunters continuing their search, they then find the cop mostly eaten and decide to take on his appearance. Again, how did this cop <laughs> like the alien things. so that this could form? Bro, who knows? Maybe we'll talk about that, but in fact, you know what? Yeah, you let's discuss. So again, space. we go back to these nerds and their ability to take on oh characteristics, but it's more than just molding skin. As we have seen when the first guy transforms, the skull forms, then the muscle, then the skin. All of this is going to be completely foreign from what we can tell, so we see no eyes or like the ability of the body to recognize information of what it's seeing. And sometimes we can actually take like a oh, look at plants yeah, to see how this process may take place just more rapidly. Have you ever seen a certain plant mimic an animal's shape? Praying mantis, birds, snakes, it's rather interesting. Yeah, and you may be tempted to think to yourself times. that a plant must know what other species look like despite having no eyes, but it's not really the case. This is just a successful trait that happened a long time ago that is now being expressed. You can think of it sort of like a complete coincidence because it was successful in keeping away pest mm. species and then helping the plant to pollinate more effectively. It goes down to a genetic level more than anything. Now this species okay. does not okay. appear to have eyes as stated, however, two eyepieces do go over where the eye should be when they are on their ship. So it must be like some sort of photosensitive area where eyes are not really there in a traditional sense like with us but they're able to take in visual information regardless. In comparison, our sense. retina does the same exact thing. It is just a layer of photosensitive cones and rods that relay information to the optic nerve that is then interpreted by the occipital lobe. This layer of light sensitive cells may not yeah, be right. really giving any visual distinction to us, but that does not mean that they cannot see. Using visual information, it's rather interesting though, as this would involve building a layer of cells potentially genetically different from the actual green host. So you can think of these cells on this phase almost like a stem cell. It has not specialized into any type of cell and as I... such, it can be changed. At their will, they can build up these stem cells based on visual information to take on a similar structure as to what they see. This would require masterful control of genetics and if done, it would make the species functionally Ooh. immune, or I may be going out there with this, but if you could control your genes to this point, it could make you immune to genetic diseases and <laughs> essentially make you immortal by normal means of death. See, we see this in jellyfish, for instance. Yeah. They have these same capabilities. I mean, honestly, if humanity could control our very genetic uh, structure, we honestly, who wouldn't become kind of some kind of monster? <laughs> As a jellyfish like ages, awesome. its genetics degrade. So when it gets near the end of its lifespan, it simply starts over. The genes get like renewed and enter a renewed state, and it continues its life. So the ability to control genes at this level is not a complete work of science fiction, but a structural expression being controlled to this degree would be absolutely mind-boggling. It may also be simply that maybe there was technology that they utilized that they could not naturally obtain. Although, I tend to think that this is an adaptation, because other species don't appear to have that. And I know this is supposed to be about the critters, but these dudes are yeah. like massively interesting as a race. Someday they hopefully humanity will have critters. xenobiology on, on the roster, and I'm already jealous of my great great grand offspring if that is the case. So as Sally calls out to Jeff, she says, well I have to wash my hair tonight and that's why I can't go on a date. Bruh, what? <laughs> You delete a number uh, at that point. Like, hey, yeah, okay, all right, gal, you go wash your hair. I'm going to go yeah, talk to somebody else. The hell. So they take the car and then bounce out. Back at the house, the dad has wrapped his wounds and realizes the poison was actually in the quill. And I don't know why I just said poison weird. So, okay, back out at the bar, these two have been making out for like 45 minutes at this point. And, like, I get it, but, <laughs> my God, that's got to be uncomfortable. 
You have to hit puberty to understand that reference. Oh my god. So the radio goes <laughs> out, and the duo then gets attacked by the creatures. It begins eating Steve, good lord, as April attempts to take it out, as the family then hears her screaming. April is smacking the creature as Brad throws some fireworks yeah. at it, and then it just eats the fireworks, which then it explodes and, then, and takes boom. it out. These things are really not all that difficult to put down if you think about it. They're essentially hairy, landbound piranha. So They're now Charlie arrives at the station telling Sally to call Harv. Lots of names, I know, but Charlie runs out and then heads to the bowling alley as the church is having a meeting at like 9 p.m. on a Friday. I'm not really sure why. Do the that? police cruiser then breaks through as the squad shows up asking for the Krites. Yes, very good job blending in, guys. To be honest with you, if this was your plan all along, oh, why didn't you just take your ship and land in the town? Why blend in at all? And again, <laughs> what is really the point of going through this transformation in front of everyone? Because they're going to know you're not human. These bounty yeah. hunters are not too good at their job. So turning into no, the they father, don't. they then blow up a piano and it's getting like, why? And after doing that, they just sort of nope out of there. Like, 100% necessary. So now, Jay, lock and load, right, brides we'll of... Even. Wait, I've already no. used that. A lot of reference. We're good to go. Helen is freaking out, but they should have grabbed the pellet dispenser a while ago. Like, almost immediately. They decide it's time to <laughs> leave as they head you. back out to the truck, but it's been destroyed. So then they go to check on Steve's car as one is in there. Like, just skeet shoot that thing, brother. Like, get rid of it. So it begins big. tumbleweeding towards them menacingly. There's no, something I've never thought I would say. As then they get locked out <laughs> and the dad gets attacked again. Man, this dude has, like, the worst luck. Brad then runs around and climbs God. a tree as he heads inside, and then they can get the door unlocked. They reload man's answer to the Xeno scum as Brad gets the door yes. open to which Gun. the Krites weren't aware that they had some way to take them out. Like, humans, they didn't know, like, oh, well, these Maybe? things could actually destroy Man. us. Remember, ah! it was man-made in God's image, not you, creature. So as the critters didn't get blown away, I'm surprised they even accomplished this, because so far, <laughs> everyone's aim has been about as useful as a glass hammer. So over at the bowling alley, Charlie continues drinking instead of worrying about the aliens, because why not, as the gruesome twosome finally arrive. Uh -oh. Walking through, this is like a highly populated bowling alley. They grab a bowling ball and then just sort of start, like, breaking stuff. Like, why? Well, why not, you nerd? So as they enter the saloon yep, of the bowling not? alley, LOL, they approach the bar. They ask where the Krites are as they begin, like, it turns into a fight of sorts, as again, the alien changes and immediately makes their presence known. Again, great job okay, blending in, guys. So it's around this time cool. that Harv gets a phone call. The Reverend calls to tell him it's going down. Basements. Mobilizing their aging police force, thank God we're all saved. Back at the house, Ella <laughs> then yells at Brad about checking the doors and windows. And he's like, Mom, I already checked. She's like, check again, Brad! That's the critters begin their attack Hope on the boys actually is that screechy if you watch the original movie. Family by breaking through the window, Brad grabs a pellet dispenser, and all I can think is, why not just, like, punt these things? Like, an infant necromorph in dead space. Dropping a ceiling <laughs> fan seems to take them out as well, so, like, a kick to the face should suffice. So the yeah. town is now fully aware that they are under attack by something. The family has now retreated to one room, which would have been, like, a... Just pull uh, John Carpenter and say, yeah, you too, kick move from the drop like you know one entrance uh one exit like you can watch them so like a window and a closed door brad says that he will go for help as nobody else has the capability i mean april has the capability she just doesn't want to and brad is going to ride his bike and april is going to sit there like a total loser and do nothing good work april so brad then jumps from a second story <laughs> roof you, with like no issues and see i did that a lot as a teen for reasons and now my ankles hurt brad almost Ow. immediately gets spotted as a crite rolls after him and starts growing it has reached the point where it's had enough food, and you most definitely do not want these things becoming an endemic species if they can grow like this, unless they taste good. In which case, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe we should make them endemic. We eat 75 can, million can chickens you, a day, and those things used them? to be dinosaurs. So Helen wakes up from the poison dart as the creature continues trying to break in. Of course, we get like the standard 80s scene where the creatures tear apart the house mischievously, and you know, there's a reference can, to E.T. Geez. because of course there is. Brad at this point then runs out into the road, almost gets run over, but luckily the bounty hunters know how the brakes work. He then tells them where they are Thank as they God. head back to his house. One of the creatures continues to try to break through the window, and then the dresser as they exit the room and blow apart oh. one of the critters. Interesting to see, as it almost has like a yellowish blood. So what does that mean exactly? So there are a few things we can surmise about the metabolism of the critters. First and foremost, they appear to be an oxygen-based metabolism, or at least have one, much like humans do, as they're okay. able to happily exist within our atmosphere with a very little issue. That now, makes one sense. of the things people have always brought up is like, well, how do you know it's oxygen-based? How, how, what about nitrogen? Uh, nitrogen is N2 within our body, and you need to understand physics for this, but essentially, nitrogen is triple bonded with itself which is incredibly difficult to break mm. it's almost like you wouldn't even get that amount of energy out just by breaking it like the energy you have to put in is not what you're going to get out is, is essentially okay, that makes the, sense. the breakdown of that but o2 gives you 
positive energy flow. So just be aware of that. It's just, it's really, really hard for anything to just breathe into. Um, it's, it's not going to essentially in any form be reactive yeah. in your body. So no, most things you aren't going to, like we breathe in nitrogen right now, but really we're breathing it in because it's most of our atmosphere. But what we're really after is the oxygen. So anyways, there would be nothing to suggest that these creatures are somehow more durable than humans or more fit for an environment given that they can actually be taken out with a ceiling fan. So like an adaptation that potentially the Krites have may be quite similar to insects on our planet. Take ants for instance. They possess a material in their bodies that is quite similar to the fluid that came out of the Krite that just got bodied. Known as hemolymph, this thick oh, fluid contains nutrition and oxygen keeping the body alive, but it's typically going to be in an open circulatory system. Now, I don't believe the Krites are exactly like insects, though, given like how they grow, which we have seen once they eat enough, they will absolutely increase in size considerably. But their body would not be properly saturated with oxygen if they did not have access to some sort of internal closed circulatory system. However, the fluid contained within is likely yeah. similar to ants. The quills themselves may actually act as some sort of breathing tube that is located all over the body that allows for the entry of oxygen. Along with this, they would appear to need a way to actually like put air over their vocal cords, indicating that either lungs exist within, and if the lungs exist, a way to pump the hemolith needs to also exist, suggesting that there could be something like a heart present. And this would be quite standard issue, I'm also given the level of intelligence they require, because this is going to use quite a bit of oxygen to support their brain function. Because remember, the nerd in your head requires 20% of all oxygen that comes into your body. Like, bro, yeah. leave some for the rest of us. And once again, <laughs> considering that they, like, eat and nutrient acquisition is also highly important, so a digestive system to properly fuel their body and the apparent tripling in size is necessary, this again supports the notion mm. that there is an internal closed circulatory system as they grow in size so the body's tissue could be properly saturated and with an open circulatory system just, it's just going to lead to their eventual end if they grow and the big thing to remember yeah, is they right. chose to come to earth they didn't just like happen here they probably did a atmospheric composition test and then saw okay let's go there so back to the chaos <laughs> the other one then no, tumbled no, no 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 you know what they did and they they scanned the planet and was like, like, hey, is there anything to eat on this planet? And it was like, yeah, there's some stuff that you don't know. Oh, let's go down. That's it? They don't care about the atmosphere or any of that. They're just looking for food. Feeds <laughs> away, Christ. which is now officially a verb, <laughs> and the large one continued trying to break into the room. Heading downstairs, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble taking these things seriously. The bounty hunters then break in as Brad runs back inside hearing his cat meow. Harv shows up to check on the house. The bounty oh, hunters crap. make their way through, destroying the Krites. These force multipliers that they're <laughs> using is kind of like using a sledgehammer to put a nail in, and Harv gets thrown out of the room through a window as Brad keeps looking for Chewie. Star Wars reference. The movie Critters was absolutely one? gaming the algorithm like you wouldn't believe. So finding Professor Furface, he grabs him as the cat freaks out because the larger one now runs in and then flees oh, outside God. the window. It grabbed April and ran off. Brad now goes to give chase, which, Bruh. what is your plan there, bro? The bounty hunters then head over to Harv's car as theirs is dead to go give chase after the last crite. So as Brad is riding his bike, somehow in that massive area available known as Kansas, he runs into Charlie. Now, either this was intentional or accidental, hey. I don't know. Both are ridiculous in their own way. So Brad and Charlie then squat up and go give chase. April is getting dragged into the ship, which is never a good thing. And I'm assuming oh, she's no. going to be a snack for later, like Men in Black style. Entering the ship, Brad pulls the poison dart out of her neck as he literally has a pipe concussive force detonator. Like, how did Brad make that? Anyhow, he gets oh, spotted yeah, by the Krites, who then oh, try to start God, the ship and take bad. off. Charlie makes a Molotov cocktail at this point, which then ignites the firecracker as they call it that is not a firecracker do you see that no, thing it's not so as the ship then takes off their house gets blown up which is sort of a jerk move as they realize the improvised firecracker blows causing krites to go up with their ship and ruins their entire day but because they're done brad says thanks to the bounty hunters as they give them a card if they ever need to call them again the watching their house go up in flames i guess that's the end of their home isn't it or is it Finding Chewie outside, they look at the burning rubble the next day as the card Brad got from earlier reconstructs oh, the entire hey, house. May have been an integral thing to relay to him. So uh, that roof is still looking pretty rough, though. And just like <laughs> that, the bounty hunters take off and everyone is no worse for wear, despite several cross-contamination events, uh, that one cop who got totally bodied, and yeah, the exchange of did. microbes along with that. Hmm. Also, alien eggs were left behind, meaning that we now have more problems, just the ones that were taken out. Sequel. And thus concludes Critters. The Krite species is one that if it lands on a planet, it's very likely to overwhelm the entire ecosystem in only a matter of months. No Being doubt that they are somewhat that. intelligent, their ability to mobilize and move once reaching a certain amount would present an issue for any species wishing to preserve their homeworld. Basically, the Krites are space herpes. 
potentially moving oh, from planet to planet. Why would you say that? Maybe that initially there were not many of them on their home world, but it grew out of control, consuming everything on the surface once a certain technological level would be reached. Much like Zoidberg's people with the anchovies, <laughs> they would think to themselves, ah, one more can't hurt, and this would necessitate the need to all. jump worlds, where at this point other species would be forced to take notice. This may be why they were slated for extinction, as just like on their home world, they have an ability to spread across the galaxy, wiping out all life, eventually leading to their mm -hmm. own starvation. They are an oviparous species as well, meaning they lay eggs, meaning that if they could land on a planet, lay their eggs, and then move on to the next one through planet hopping methods, it pretty much means they can take over anything. They Very likely on their home planet, on given the way that they reproduce on, on and how voracious they are, there were species that kept them in if check. If you don't get the reference of what Grey Goo is, do yourself the favor and actually look it up. It's pretty damn interesting sci-fi. But unfortunately, because they developed sapiens, they may have been able to kind of override this new predator or the old predatory species, meaning they start to grow out of control. So first, the issue could be dealt with, but considering how fast they grow, they may also be a species of indeterminate growth, meaning the more they eat, the larger they get to a certain point, as not to violate the square cube law because physics remains undefeated in the parking lot. This may also be why the bounty hunters have such powerful countermeasures at their disposal in order to deal with the large ones. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be awesome of you, and subscribe is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. Hopefully this one isn't as echoey. I've kind of changed some things around and moved rooms, so yeah, hopefully really it sounds better. But I'll drop my merch, Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links to Roanoke Tales in the description. And speaking of patrons, I'd like... I think that's going to be it for today's video. I hope you all enjoyed this. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more. Link to the original will be in the description below. And I'll see all you folks next time when we flick on. Peace out.